Welcome to our segment on Planetary Nebula. Planetary Nebula represent some of the most beautiful objects in the Milky Way. In this segment, we'll talk about what they are and how far away they are. Then I'll show you some of the spectacular pictures taken by the Hubble Space Telescope. But first, I'd like to take a minute to go over how we create these photographs. When someone looks through a telescope, the light from the object falls on a person's eye. To take a photograph, all you have to do is replace the eye with a photographic plate. Here we see Planetary Nebula NGC 2818. It's what someone would see if they were looking through the telescope. It's a wisp. It's very nebulous. So it gets its name Nebula, by the way. To the untrained eye, it might look like nothing at all. But if we increase the time exposure and let more and more light from the object fall onto the photographic plate, we get dramatically better results get a much sharper image. It's no longer a wisp. You begin to see that there's something serious there with structure. Then, repeating the process with a filter using a small frequency band of light gives us the first pass on color. Repeating this process with different bands and combining the photos produces the full astronomical photo effect. The frequency bands chosen can represent different temperatures of gases or different colors might be used to represent different elements present in the nebula. In 2818, we have red representing nitrogen, green represents hydrogen, and blue represents oxygen. Of course, today's telescopes no longer use photographic plates. Instead, a charge coupled device, or CCD for short, is used. These enable direct connections between an object's incoming photons and its image on a computer. Here's how they work. CCDs are based on a principle called the photoelectric effect. If a photon with sufficient energy hits an electron in the outer shell of an atom, the transfer of energy to the electron can be enough to free it from the atom altogether. This is a fundamental component of quantum mechanics, first analyzed by Albert Einstein in 1905. CCDs use a thin wafer of silicon to produce electrons from photons because silicon easily releases electrons with visible light. A tiny positively charged capacitor is attached to the silicon wafer in order to collect the freed electrons. If we get one electron for each photon in the range, we'd have 100% quantum efficiency. The highest quality CCDs can achieve up to 90% quantum efficiency. It's interesting to note that the quantum efficiency of the human eyes, rods and cones, is only 1%. The photons start producing electrons as soon as the shutter is opened. The capacitor collects the freed electrons until the shutter is closed. At that point, the voltage across the capacitor represents the number of electrons the capacitor collected. This information is sent to the computer. All of this is miniaturized into an integrated circuit and represents one pixel. CCDs are made of thousands or even millions of these configured as an array. The CCD on Hubble's Wide Field Camera 2 has two 2K by 4K arrays for an 8 megapixel CCD. And as before, for color, we simply repeat observations with filters. For example, here's Hubble's photograph of the planetary nebula MYCN18, 8,000 light years away. This picture has been composed from three separate images taken with a blue filter to identify light from oxygen, and a green filter to identify light from hydrogen, and a red filter to identify light from nitrogen. 
As you can see from these first two examples, planetary nebula are not about planets. They're about stars. It got the name planetary when early astronomers, using small primitive telescopes, first spotted these objects. They looked like disks, similar to what they had seen when they looked at Jupiter and Neptune. Planetary nebula are actually stars, like our Sun, that are going through a typical end-of-life cycle. They have ejected much of their mass into their surroundings and then collapsed in an explosion that ejects a massive amount of additional material at much higher velocities. The faster moving material crashes into the slower moving stuff to create spectacular formations. This helix nebula is just one of them. Here we have the fluorescing tube or a donut where we're looking straight down the middle of it. A forest of thousands of comet-like filaments embedded along the inner rim of the nebula point back towards the central star, which is a small, super-hot white dwarf. That's what's left. Each filament is around the size of our entire solar system. Based on the nebula's distance of 650 light years, triangulating its angular size corresponds to a huge ring with a diameter of nearly three light years. It would fill most of the space between our Sun and our nearest star, Proxima Centauri. The cat's eye is one of the most complex planetary nebula with surprisingly intricate structures, including concentric gas shells, jets of high-speed gas, and unusual shock-induced knots. These features made the Cat's Eye Nebula perfect for developing a new way to figure out how far away planetary nebula are. Fact is, we don't know a lot about the distance to most of these objects. There may be as many as 25,000 planetary nebula in the Milky Way, but only 300 have distances that have been measured with some reasonable accuracy. This is due primarily to the nature of the nebula themselves. You'll recall that two of our most useful tools for figuring out how far away is it are standard candles, like Cephids, and Parallax. But because planetary nebula stars are surrounded by the debris of their own ejection, it is hard to get a good luminosity reading for standard candles and equally hard to locate a good star nearby to use for parallax calculations. In recent years, however, observations made using the Hubble Space Telescope have allowed a new method of determining distances, called expansion parallax. As we know, all planetary nebula are expanding, and observations, taken several years apart, with high enough resolution, can reveal the angular growth of the nebula in the plane of the sky. Using the Doppler effect to approximate the velocity of the expanding material, we can calculate the distance the nebula expanded. With that, simple math gives us the distance to the cat's eye. 3,260 light years. Most people have had the experience of hearing the pitch of a car horn, train whistle, or ambulance siren drop off as the source moves past. As the sound source moves towards the observer, the sound waves are compressed, making the pitch of the sound higher. As the sound source moves away from the observer, the sound waves are stretched out, making the pitch of the sound lower. The same effect works for light. Here we have the visible spectrum from a star. Hydrogen in the star's atmosphere creates absorption lines with a unique pattern. Here's the pattern for a star at rest with respect to the observer. Light from an approaching star has its wavelengths shortened. 
we see that the lines shift to the blue. They are said to be blue shifted. And light from a receding star as its wavelengths lengthened, we see the lines shift to the red. They are said to be red shifted. The key to measuring the Doppler effect is to measure the change in position of the spectral lines. The further the shift, the faster the radial velocity. With this Doppler effect, we can determine three important things about stars and the gases surrounding them. We can determine how fast stars and star material are moving towards or away from us. We can detect and measure orbital motion of binary stars. And we can even determine how fast a star is rotating. Let's take a look at just some of the most beautiful planetary nebula scattered across the galaxy. Here we have the Dumbbell Nebula. It was the first planetary nebula ever discovered. Charles Meser found it back in 1764. Here's a close-up taken by Hubble. This object is named Gomez's Hamburger. The star has already expelled large amounts of gas and dust and is on its way to becoming a colorful, glowing planetary nebula. But at this point, it is simply reflecting its light off the dust. The intricate structure of this stellar debris forms a dramatic reverse S shape. Looking at the detail, the nebula shows a series of dense knots in the clouds of gas. Now what's going on here is that the radiation from the dying star is carving the knots into shape, much like water flowing around a rock in a stream. And these are all pointing towards the center of the nebula. The knots are a reminder of just how vast the planetary nebula is. Just like in the Helix Nebula, each and every one is the size of our entire solar system. Here we are zooming into the Ring Nebula, one of the earliest and most famous of all planetary nebula. As you can see, it closely resembles the Helix Nebula we covered earlier. We are looking almost directly down one of the poles of the structure, with a brightly colored barrel of material stretching away from us. From Earth's perspective, the Ring Nebula looks like a simple elliptical shape with a fuzzy boundary. But the new Hubble observations show clearly that the nebula is actually shaped more like a distorted donut. The main structure of the nebula is a broad ring of nitrogen. That's the red ring you see. The hotter gas is oxygen, seen in green here, and it fills the interior. What's even hotter still is helium, seen here as blue oblong lobes stretching out perpendicular to the nebula's main structure and looking like a rugby ball. Our first planetary nebula were facing the Earth so that we could see down the tube. On this one, the Retina Nebula, we are viewing the donut from the side. The red rectangle is one of the most unusual nebula known in the Milky Way because of its rectangular shape. This unique planetary nebula resembles the head and thorax of a garden variety ant. It has intriguing symmetrical patterns. It could be that there is a binary star system at the heart of the nebula creating the symmetrical patterns.
my favorite, and one of the most beautiful of all celestial objects, this planetary nebula looks like a delicate butterfly. But it is far from serene. What resembles dainty butterfly wings are actually rolling cauldrons of gas heated to more than 36,000 degrees Fahrenheit, tearing across space at more than 966,000 kilometers per hour. That's 600,000 miles per hour. This object is known to amateur astronomers as the Little Ghost Nebula because it appears as a small ghostly cloud surrounding the faint dying central star. This nebula's chaotic structure suggests that the star shed its mass sporadically. During each outburst, the star expelled material in a different direction. This can be seen in the two bowtie-shaped lobes. This Hubble picture of NGC 6572 shows the intricate shapes that can develop as stars expel their atmospheres. You can see the central white dwarf star the origin of the nebula, now a faint, hot, white dwarf. 6572 only began to shed its gases a few thousand years ago, so it is a fairly young planetary nebula. As a result, the material is still quite concentrated, which explains why the nebula is abnormally bright. As it becomes more diffuse, it will dim. The Twin Jet Nebula is a striking example of a bipolar planetary nebula. Bipolar planetary nebula are formed when the central object is not a single star, but a binary system. The nebula's size increases with time, and measurements of this rate of increase suggest that the stellar outburst that formed the lobes occurred just 1,200 years ago. NGC 6153 is a planetary nebula that is elliptical in shape with an extremely rich network of loops and filaments, shown clearly in this Hubble image. However, this is not what makes this planetary nebula so interesting for astronomers. Measurements show that 6153 contains large amounts of neon, argon, carbon, and chlorine, up to three times more than can be found in our solar system. Although it may be that the star developed higher levels of these elements as it grew and evolved, it seems more likely that the star originally formed from a cloud of material that already contained lots more of these elements. This new detailed Hubble image shows a planetary nebula in the making, a protoplanetary nebula. A dying star, hidden behind dust and gas in the center of the nebula, has ejected massive amounts of gas. Parts of the gas have reached tremendous velocities of up to 1.5 million kilometers per hour. That's 932,000 miles per hour. Cahotec 455 is named after its discoverer, Czech astronomer Lobos Cahotec. This is nicknamed the Eskimo Nebula because when viewed through ground-based telescopes, it resembles a face surrounded by a fur parka. Although this bright central region resembles a ball of twine, it is in reality a bubble of material being blown into space by the central star's intense wind of high-speed material. NGC 6751 is strikingly unusual for planetary nebula. 
and it looks like a giant eye. The nebula is a cloud of gas ejected several thousand years ago from the hot star visible in its center. The Hubble telescope took this image in 1998. It shows faint arcs and filaments embedded within the diffuse gas of the nebula's smooth bow-tie lobes. The nebula's shape appears to have been created by very fierce 500,000 km per hour winds blowing gas away from the dying central star. That's 310,000 miles per hour. This rapid expansion of the nebula has made it one of the coldest known regions in the universe. Huge waves are sculpted into this two-lobed nebula. It harbors one of the hottest stars known, and its powerful stellar winds generate waves 100 billion kilometers high. The waves are caused by supersonic shocks, formed when the local gas is compressed and heated in front of the rapidly expanding lobes. The atoms caught up in the shock emit the spectacular radiation seen in this image. SUWT2, the central star, is actually a close binary system where two stars completely circle each other every five days. The interaction of these stars and the more massive star that sheds material to create the nebula formed the ring structure. The burned out core of the massive companion has yet to be found inside the nebula. This nebula is dubbed the starfish because of its shape. The six lobes of gas and dust, which resemble the legs of a starfish, suggest that the nebula puffed off material at least three times in three different directions. NGC 5315 is a chaotic looking nebula and it reveals a, uh, an X-shaped structure. This nebula forms a winding blue cloud that perfectly aligns with two stars at its center. In 1999, astronomers discovered that the star at the upper right is in fact the central star of the nebula and the star to the lower left is probably a true physical companion of the central star. The Hubble Space Telescope captured this beautiful planetary nebula with glowing wisps of outpouring gas that are lit up by a central star nearing the end of its life. The vivid red and blue hues in this image come from the material glowing under the action of the fierce ultraviolet radiation from the still hot central star. Planetary nebula are one of the main ways in which elements heavier than hydrogen and helium are dispersed into space after their creation in the hearts of stars. Eventually, some of this ejected material may form new stars and planets. The Necklace Nebula consists of a bright ring measuring 19 trillion kilometers across, that's 12 trillion miles, dotted with dense, bright knots of gas that resemble diamonds in a necklace. The knots glow brightly due to absorption of ultraviolet light from the central stars. Although most stars go through this process, only a few can be seen in the Milky Way. This is because over a relatively short time, few million years, the ejected gases get so far away from the star that they no longer fluoresce or reflect light from the central dying star. Then all we have are the white dwarfs. Our sun will end its life as one of these planetary nebulas. The Hubble images show that our sun's fate probably will be more interesting complex and striking 
than astronomers imagined just a few years ago. But not until several billion years from now. In our segments on stars, we introduced a number of rungs for our cosmic distance ladder. Stellar parallax, the HR diagram, and two standard candles, Cepheids and RR Lyra. In this segment, we added expansion parallax. In our next segment, we'll add star clusters and supernova. <laughs> 